Okay, so um, yeah, hi all. Um, I'd like to welcome you to my talk um, called Docker Introduction and Overview. So don't be scared. Um, it's not getting getting that complicated for right after lunch. I'll leave the command to um, to the other guys. So let's start by introducing myself. My name is Volker Gantico. I yeah once studied computer science at Fordham University, graduated back in 2009, and I'm now working as a senior systems engineer for uh, for an IT service company. And there work for a team providing IT services um, for customers, computer added engineering site for German automotive engineers, um, which includes uh, operating their heterogeneous um, environment and on-site HPC installation with roughly 500 plus nodes, at least in this part of the customer. And it is used for various um, CAE related applications. So also I'm a frequent attendant and uh, speaker at IT and especially Linux and open source conferences like CBIT and Linux Talk. And I recently took a PhD program when doing research uh, on improving HPC in cloud um, related environments. So if anybody should be interested in um, service level management as a service accountability for clouds, um, you should check out um, the homepage of um, Hochschule Furtwang. It's called Volker Heiß Furtwang. They're doing research there on these topics, and my work goes there too somehow. So the company I work for is Science and Computing AG in Tübingen, and um, yeah, our main focus is IT services and software for technical, computation, and scientific environments, so more or less everything that has to do with complex distributed environments, like yeah, operating these environments, IT, uh, IT administration tools, queuing system, everything that goes into compute clusters, data managed visualization, virtualization, IT security, and we were founded in 1989. have offices in uh, Tübingen, Munich, Berlin, Düsseldorf, and Ingolstadt, and are around 320 employees, and, uh, yeah, and now belong to the Atlas group. So um, I think I'm gonna skip this. If anybody uh, should be interested in yeah, new job opportunities, we've got several offerings, so feel free to check out the job site. And um, enough of commercial break, let's get to the topic. So the title is Docker Introductions. I'm gonna start with, yeah, an introduction to Docker, obviously, what it is, what it's not. So don't worry, it's not gonna get too technical. Remember lunch break. And um, then I'm gonna to continue with why HPC matters with focus on scientific computing community. And as everybody probably has heard, Docker is way too insecure. Um, yeah, I'm gonna cover this um, with a little bit of security um, as well. If there should be time left, I'll give you a very brief introduction on how to get started, um, but we'll see if there's time left. So, um, let's do <coughs> things differently this part, so a few questions to the audience. Please raise your hand. Um, who of you has heard of Docker? Okay, so you, uh, you're exactly <coughs> in the right room. So, who knows what Docker is and how it can hopefully make your life better, at least your IT life. Okay, most of them. Who has actually tried Docker? Okay, and who uses Docker? I, I don't know on a regular basis or something. Okay, and who is using Docker in production yet? Okay, very few people. And um, do you use additional tools? Okay, so nobody's really using bare metal um, Docker, really. Okay, so um, tools are not included, but for the next time perhaps. So what it is, um, what is Docker? So. Docker is um, <coughs> the sort of hype, uh, hype topic at the moment for quite a while actually now. And there's really no conference you can atta attend without finding talks on it. So first of all, it revived the already dead considered um, operating level um, virtualization. But um, more on this later, it is getting much attention, praised by excited users, lots of creative ideas on how to use it, but also rants. And at the moment, everybody seems to want to join the Docker Fun Club and even VMware and especially Citrix who are about to um, do something with Docker with the next Xen server release. Um, last time I spoke with them, they were not exactly sure what they're gonna do, but they wanted to do Docker. So Docker seems just like the sort of must-have feature at the moment, which is justified, I think. So um, if you look at the Docker definition from the Docker website, um, it used to describe Docker as an open platform to build, ship, and run distributed applications anywhere. They later redefined the anywhere aspect to laptops, data centers, especially VMs, or the cloud, um, which shows that it just goes further than providing some sort of runtime for containers, but also providing a complete environment around it and more or less an ecosystem. And that it's meant for both developers and admi admins 
and um, yeah, quite on a lot of systems, um, which look like uh, looks like a very big promise. So what are we here for? Docker. And um, let's start with a quick Docker 101. So first of all, Docker is an application for isolating applications and as technical means it uses operating system um, level virtualization. And it simplifies just the transport, the provisioning, <coughs> transport and isolation of um, used resources. The isolation means that container A is not meant to have any exit, uh, access to what's running inside of container B unless otherwise wanted. So it uses the kernel technology, C groups and namespaces, and it formerly relied on the LXC, the Linux kernel into uh, Linux container um, interface, um, but moved to their own libdocker more or less recently. And it offers quite a lot of features. So um, let's start with some term uh, terminology. We're gonna use this for the talks, or I need this for the talks later. So if you look at the diagram, you can see a lot of things. First of all, you have the Docker host. This is the system that is actually running the uh, Docker daemon, and um, yeah, with, with urge, yeah, when comparing to regular virtualization, this is your host system. Um, then you have the Docker daemon, um, which controls the containers, and it is accessed by the Docker client. And um, yeah, in general, the command line interface for inter uh, interacting with the daemon. So those are the, ah, I should have shown this. Um, those are the core components. Um, that's the way it looks in a Linux system. When you want to use Docker um, on Windows or OS X or something, you can't use it there natively. So um, the reason behind this is, yeah, <coughs> it's not supported, at least for, for, for OS X yet. Microsoft is working on it. And you have to have some special um, virtual machine with the, with the whole system in the background. Um, this is why we have this additional layer here. So, um, yeah, for the workflow components, uh, most important here are the Docker images. These are the entities containing the application you want to ship and all the required uh, environment and company, uh, components like libraries, for example. So the Docker container is a uh, running instance created from one of these images. And it's the entity you start or stop, um, for example. Then you have the Docker registry, um, which is more or less some sort of app stores for, for Docker images. Um, you can have these um, public, for example, um, accessing Docker Hub or um, private registries as well. Um, yeah, then we, I, th I think he's going to cover later uh, the Docker files. Those are the definitions required to automate an image build. So um, I give you a, hopefully give you a brief um, overview on the getting started section. So what can Docker do for you? save lives, perhaps. Um, in general, people now talk about how great Docker is for shipping code and makes it just less, less error prone, how it can end fights between developers um, writing applications and shipping them to operations for deploying them, and um, afterwards, it doesn't work. And um, yeah, everybody says, but it worked on my machine. Yeah, but it's not. So um, where I come from, things are quite a bit different. I don't have to deal with developers, God bless, I have to deal with customers. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we also, yeah, we all need a, a good, we have a good need for isolation dependencies and the results are more or less the same. So um, what's the problem? So this is a classic setup without Docker. Um, I have a web server, it's just a fictive example. Um, I have a solver and they share this, this libc. If I don't know, um, for, for any reasons, I have to update um, the web server. It might require a new libc version, which, which might break the solver, for example. So risks can arise when either the application or the operating system um, is either updated or well outdated. So for example, new applications might not, yeah? yeah I mean, maybe solver, is everyone familiar with solver? It's uh, just, could be any program, right? So yeah, I mean, solver is more, more, more or less from an HPC background, yeah. so it's, yeah. Um, this could be any generic application. We run into this um, a, on, a, on a more or less daily basis. So um, the main problem is, for example, um, new applications might not run on your outdated or yeah, conservative operating system, or outdated applications might not run on a current OS. Um, for example, we had to keep a historic SUSE 6.4 installation for, for years because it was the newest version for special required code um, that was able to run only on this machine. And this code was necessary for um, customer readable, uh, having the possibility to uh, re do, do some recalculations of stuff. So this code was just 
yeah, let you see, but he, yeah, he insists that you should be <coughs> alive. So um, besides legacy requirements, even in everyday use, there's also a certain risk for breaking applications when updating the operating system, even with enterprise distributions. And this is just bad for critical applications. For example, um, when updating, um, yeah, you have to install security updates. Uh, happened recently, and it just broke um, one of the um, CAE applications of one engineer. The guy was sitting around and said, why the heck did you update my machine? And um, yeah, security policy, it's not our idea, we have to. And um, it was just work, uh, it was, he was just sitting there and um, couldn't work because it broke his, it, it broke his machine. So we had to reinstall the machine uh, back to the old level, um, stick the security updates for his machine and get him running again. So, and sometimes also it happens that uh, trying a new tool, um, for example, out of curiosity, can result in the need for updating an operating system. Docker changes this. Um, don't get confused by these, they're just in case I give a handout and um, summarize what I said. So, in a containerized setup, we have this. We have container A, um, container 1, um, containing the web server, and container B, uh, 2, containing server A. So, um, with Docker, what we have here is all-in-one entity. So both applications um, and all their required and, um, dependencies um, are isolated. So updating libc in container has absolutely no impact whatsoever on um, libc here. So, and we have a portable entity. Um, all you need to run a container is the Docker runtime here. So um, this means you can move this container to whatever machine you want, your laptop, your workstation, your cluster, even your cloud or your bare metal HPC provider or something. So um, one not so typical example with this legacy hell. Um, don't get scared. Um, actually, it's quite simple. And um, I, I choose this picture because it contains all the fancy bad passwords we learned, like Dockerfile um, and so on. Um, the point is we had to containerize a historic FlexLM uh, license server. So um, it's just an example for legacy dependency from hell. So don't get scared by the complexity. Uh, it's, it's just, in fact, it's really simple. A colleague of mine was tasked with this. A customer um, had to use a special outdated license for MATLAB, which would only run on a very specific vendor, um, specific vendor daemon, which is required for the license to run. And this, on the other hand, would only run with a very specific uh, FlexLM version. So both would not run either on um, a current CentOS system, um, only with a very outdated version you didn't want to keep around due to security issues. So the solution was to containerize the vendor daemon along with the outdated FlexLM in a CentOS 5 container, um, which is not really supported, but it worked. And yeah, as this was a licensed server triple, um, he had to use three containers, you can see here, and um, they were network accessible by the client. Um, and so, yeah, we got this thing working. Uh, redundancy was not required, so could, he could uh, pack it all on, on one host system. So, but it, yeah, the essence of it, um, you can, for example, use Docker to solve <coughs> such problems. So, another nice feature, I guess I should skip due to time reasons, is the possibility um, to have layered file systems um, and layer, layered images. Um, one example containing your base image, all the HPC uh, images share and um, with different application layers on top. So, virtualization 2.0. Um, so, yeah, is Docker some new of vertical may, uh, way to do virtualization? Some people tend to see Docker this way. First of all, all the things mentioned before can be done with VMs too. Um, but let's look at the architecture. Is really everything harder, better, faster, and stronger? So this is the typical way virtualization is done, and the most frequently uh, way, I'd say. Um, we have our hypervisor layer, and this is type 1 hypervisor, which sits directly on the hardware, and it offers a narrow interface um, for the virtual hardware um, upwards. And um, yeah, one of the major advantages in this approach is the possibility to mix the operating system. So running, um, you can have a VM running Windows and one with Linux on the same host system uh, as no operating system resources are shared. So container-based virtualization works quite a bit different. Uh, it offers no real hypervisor and virtualized hardware layer, which means a much smaller stack. 
Uh, the concept itself is not new. Um, for example, <coughs> Linux containers, LXC, used this approach since 2008, but never really became widely accepted. Um, change route for, for isolation is too old and lacks many features, and some might even remember the library's loans or similar techniques from yeah, more or less any of a Linux operating system. So the advantage also of, of operating level virtualization in general is a better performance, more on that later, and due to much smaller stack when you compare it, um, resulting in less overhead, faster startup times, but yeah, it limits um, the, the container operating system to the host operating system. Um, as the running kernel is the only real resource shared and the only component that can be changed. But don't get confused, you can have an Ubuntu running on a centralized host or something, but you just can't run a Windows inside of the container. So for HPC, this is not really a disadvantage, just yeah, nearly 100% of all HPC installations are Linux-based. You might even get um, a big advantage here, um, as you have only one kernel running. Um, think, of, think of patch management, for example, when you only have one uh, kernel running and you can use technologies like case nice for rebootless kernel updates, um, this is just great. So what if I told you Docker containers are no magical virtual machines? There's something different in my opinion. So what's different? Compared to VM, Docker separates applications from the underlying operating system, the way VMs separated the operating system from the underlying hardware. Uh, but when you want to ship an application, um, the OS is somehow part of this requirement. When you think of, think of an appliance or something, you want to ship to a customer. So you have a pre pretty, yeah, pretty large um, requirement. So using Docker turns this FAT requirement for VMs in a rather lightweight one. And when you compare it to other um, operating level um, virtualization techniques, Docker is more or less bringing containers to the masses. So by giving them just the tools and workflows around container and that's making it easy for everyone to use and the whole ecosystem that goes with it. For example, think of Docker Hub, uh, which is often um, compared to GitHub uh, for Docker images where you can go on and take one image, base your work on it and create something completely new, completely different, the way you can fork programs, um, yeah, projects, for example, on GitHub and share this too afterwards. I think this is a great opportunity here. So the main reason, I, but the main reason I guess is this, I remember when I spoke to Wolfgang at CBIT at, at CB about Docker and how it somehow became a game changer for um, operating level uh, operating system level virtualization and <coughs> it makes it somehow superior to LXC and everybody is crazy about Docker. And um, he just said, well, we tried that, it was just too complicated. So I, I guess this is more or less the main reason why Docker is, yeah, they're popular. It's, it's just usable compared to other solution. So in my opinion, why does Docker matter, especially for computing? As this is an IC event, I don't think I have to go into high performance computing, that it goes by many names that we used to do it on proprietary systems, now running on clusters for a decade, I guess. And um, some are even doing this on clouds um, nowadays, while others are still stuck with the workstation neatly tucked away under the desk. So it's all about somehow um, yeah, solving computational problems. Um, by many applications, for example, oil and gas, big data, or the customers I work with do uh, computational fluid dynamics. And um, yeah, they all share certain requirements besides the need for powerful systems. So uh, HPC, we all get issues. Um, and I think the point where Docker can be of great help is first of all this, um, having a clean slate for applications. As mentioned before, Docker does a pretty good job when it comes to isolating different applications. This is important when you have different versions, um, yeah, have needs for, for, um, for different conflicting libraries. And this cannot be scripted anymore or is somehow <coughs> pain in the ass to debug. Or when running legacy code on a new operating system. Or when you have to run um, new code on legacy operating systems. Or for, for kind of packaging complex software. Um, and providing um, different versions of them alongside. For example, when you use open form. So, then, uh, going a bit further, one can see Docker even as an alternative to classic application rollout. So you use Docker pull instead of yum install or whatever, what uses for rollouts. So the performance overhead is that small that one consider this as a viable alternative to a classic rollout. Think of installing a new cluster, you 
You have your classic mode installation, you install the operating system, um, you install, uh, install the, the applications and configure the application and so on and so on. So why not just roll out the operating system and the Docker runtime with it, um, then use pre-configured images for this. Um, this also makes repurposing a cluster more or less attractive, um, perhaps even for H uh, bare metal HPC providers. So when you look at the deployment, um, it's more or less this way. Docker is almost as portable and flexible as VMs, but it induces much less overhead than VMs do. Another aspect I think is pretty attractive um, in, in yeah, computing environments is to homogenize heterogeneous clusters. I know it's a bit hard to read, but the idea is simple. Clusters are usually pretty expensive and um, yeah, meant to be utilized by the, to the max. So, but um, at least where I come from, clusters are often bought um, for, for one team and running one application or one category of applications. So making the resources interchangeable, for example, when one team has an empty queue while the other has not, is often quite hassling because parallel installation of different software can be a problem and reinstalling um, yeah, the cluster for, for such a short time um, does not make any sense speaking economically. So Docker offers here the possibility to use um, a, a suitable job image at startup time. Um, what we need, and um, I forgot your name, sorry, <laughs> is going to talk a bit uh, about a bit later is the way of how to integrate this into a queuing system. For example, LSF is already um, yeah, got something working, but it's, I think it's not that feature-rich as one would, would like it to have. So another great thing um, for scientific computing <coughs> is when you have the possibility to pass on an environment. So Docker is a tool that enables this, for example, passing on an entire workflow and not just one application to a third party. Um, it can be nice, for example, testing somebody or the old problem and debugging any um, problems with, with an ISV. And he says, yeah, okay, it, those operating systems should be certified. What did you do different than the way we did? So why not just chip it um, directly as a, in a containerized form? And the access to, uh, to additional resources is getting much easier. Um, for example, yeah, dumping um, your, your image, um, your container on, on a cluster or, or to a cloud, for example. And um, deploying software this way might also be considerable for bare metal HPC providers because dynamic short-term use of resources might be a problem here in case an application is not already available there. So why not give the, the customer the possibility um, to bring along his container running bare metal? Well, why not use classical <coughs> virtualization? Uh, I already talked about a bit um, on this, but um, I think Besides the workflow aspects I already mentioned, I think the important aspect um, is performance. Performance is superior in just many use cases. Um, Docker offers almost yeah, bare metal performance. VMs have got, uh, gotten better much over time, I know, um, but this is already true for the startup time. So think, think of the time a VM um, that perhaps just does one thing, one job uh, for computation or something takes about a minute uh, to start up. This might not be a problem if you've got a computer which would be running, I don't know, three days or something, um, but for quick computations um, this can be already be a problem or at least annoying. Um, yeah, so I brought along, uh, along some benchmarks. The first one is an IBM research paper um, which measured docker performance in many circumstances against KVM and bare metal and the other one is an internal study which did at least a quick test with the CAE application. So um, if you haven't read this paper yet, you should definitely read it. It was published last year and yeah, it benchmarks Docker over the course of about 15 pages. And um, what they did is um, the bare metal setup versus KVM versus Docker, both on I uh, all three on IBM systems. And it was a really wide test with different storage and network configs. Um, they used uh, Limpack, some might be familiar with, um, memory, um, the benchmark, the memory throughput, the memory access time, network bandwidth, and so on, network latency, block I.O., um, they use Redis and uh, MySQL as a database. So um, I don't think it's not worth discussing all the outcomes. Um, what's really important is the summary that in general, the performance of Docker versus KVM, um, yeah, 
it equals or is usually better in all categories um, than KVM is. KVM in general means at least to a certain degree loss of performance, um, and even though it has gotten much better on current systems. When you compare Docker performance to bare metal, there's very, very little overhead, um, even though one should yeah, be taking aspects like, like using NAS um, or choosing the right storage backend into consideration. So if 100% bare metal performance is required, you should take the pros and cons into consideration. Um, what might be uh, interesting or important for computing is when it comes to optimal latency and high um, I.O. throughput, Docker seems to be the better choice for the findings. If only CPU and memory performance uh, is the thing mattering, uh, it's, you can also pick KVM, but you, you don't have any, any loss when you, when, you pick, um, when you pick Docker. The interesting thing is the forecast, because uh, virtualization performance has gotten much better over time. They expect this to get even more better. Um, but on the other hand, they expect the opposite to happen with Docker, as performance is already that close to bare metal, and any additional layer might degrade performance. So to sum this up, um, you should read this paper, it's worse. Um, our own research was published at the scientific conference called Closer this year, and it did much less um, benchmarking. We just um, con only concentrated on the performance degradation when comparing um, Docker performance to bare metal for real CAE applications and the conceptual aspects relevant for HPC as well. Thanks again to Sebastian Klingberg for doing the um, benchmarks. And um, our test environment consisted of several AMD servers, um, all running CentOS. Um, we used Abacus and um, yeah, an application, uh, a demo job that came along with the installation and we considered both local storage and a Lustre file system as a storage backend, and um, further details I'm going to skip. Um, what's interesting are the results. So the after average runtime <coughs> uh, native with <coughs> Docker, and our benchmark more or less um, showed that Docker only adds 2% of overhead when, when using our local disk as a storage backend, and 1% when using Lustre. So for the overall runtime of this job, of this exact job, this just meant um, one respectively two seconds overhead. So because it was a really short uh, overhead, but um, a short um, job, but think of this, putting this in a VM, waiting for the VM to fire up, uh, it would have been almost the same time like the job actually runs. So uh, especially for short running jobs, using, using Docker may be of, might be of great use. So what's next? A Little bit of security. HPC often means dealing with confidential data and this problem even gets worse in multi-tenant environment. For example, yeah, when you when you have when you have to deal with with um, research data or something. And as everybody has heard, Docker is way too unsecure. I think we should take a quick look at this if, if this is really that much of a problem. So first of all, opinions matter. Let's get started with some quotes that were taken from a very good talk with a misleading title, "Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse." Um, which Ian Jackson gave at this year's Fostum. So um, what he brought along is, was this quote from Jack Welch that some people um, just make the mistake of thinking as containers of just better and faster <coughs> ways of virtualization. And from a yeah, security point of view, um, containers are much weaker, at least to a certain degree. Um, yeah, in my opinion, virtualization during, during containers is a bit different than doing um, the way um, using virtual machines. Um, but even though um, the internal concepts like C groups and namespaces, um, the concept Docker relies on, um, which have to be considered secure, um, VMs rely on a much more tight interface offered by the hypervisor. I already talked about this, and it provides less working surface for attacks than um, the rather broad Linux kernel interface. Um, yeah, Ian Jackson compared this to a house of uh, where you'd hide from, from the zombies. Would you rather pick the one with, with huge windows or the one with really tiny holes? If your life depends on it. Um, another quote from Jerome, some might be familiar with, um, with him, um, is working for Docker. And um, virtual machines might not be that secure today, but um, yeah, they're catching up and Docker is headed, at least they say this, towards security. Um, but he's not denying that um, VMs might still be considered more secure. But then a nice one from, from Theo de Raad, um, who has some certain very distinct views. Um, 
First of all, his, his quote is, is not directed against virtualization and against container-based virtualization. It's straightly headed against virtualization at all. And he says that, yeah, you're, you're deluded if you think that virtualization can be secure if the people writing it um, don't know how to write a secure operating system. For fun fact, OpenBSD started a uh, own virtualization layer recently, like two weeks ago or something. So we'll see if they can deliver something better than we used to use at the moment. So, um, but where is absolutely right is the point is that there is no such thing like free lunch or complete bug-free software. The same goes for virtualization layer as, as yeah for any software out there. So the question is how to deal with it and how big is the impact and does it really matter that much? So um, yeah, counting the numbers. Um, yeah, Ian Jackson and his colleague um, George Dunder did, did quite a bit of beam counting and they counted all the vulnerabilities, parallel virtualized XEN, KVM, SQMU, and Linux uh, containers and classified them into three categories. Privilege escalation from guests to hosts, so where you can get, yeah, higher privileges. Um, denial of service by the guest of the host, so your, your host goes down or something, for example and uh, information leakage um, from the host to guests so which means you can get as an attacker additional information on the host and um, well one should mention both are working for Zytrix, Zytrix is a company behind um, Xen at the moment um, but the findings were that paralyzed Xen offers the smallest potential um, for attacks and a higher risk and a much higher risk for containers if you use them in a way as a general container the way you, you'd use I don't know a VM for, for example. So um, the point is, when you use containers as application containers, where the user has no access as root or something, um, all the vulnerabilities go down to about the same level as KVM, which is considered more or less secure. Um, so I don't. If you have the possibility to not use um, containers as a one-to-one -one replacement for virtual machines, it's pretty okay to use them. So um, I think in my opinion, when skipping all the possible bugs and CVEs, it shows that in general, the most level of frustration and yeah problems arises from users or certain misunderstandings. Um, I'm moving a bit away in an opposite direction to the desktop. Um, people just do wonderful things with Docker, but sometimes just overshoot the target. So this is a pretty good example by the lovely Jess Rosell, who just gives real fun talks on Docker's. And she promoted, uh, promoted um, Docker as a uh, sandbox for desktop applications. Um, her ideas are interesting without question, but uh, an actual sandbox um, with really strict isolation is somehow different. First of all, she shows how to run MUD and similar applications uh, inside a container and realizes that data like configuration has to be passed into the container. For example, Skype requires access to audio and webcam or something. She has many examples including Docker files and Docker run commands. So if you want to use, uh, learn something about using Docker on the desktop, check this out. But don't do something like this. Um, she says she was really mind blown when, then when she found out that she could partition her local hard disk um, by passing the appropriate um, device into the container. You see it's dev SDA, which means it's a local hard disk. And she passes it in into her container and then can run gpart it. So um, partition her hard disk inside the container. Um, the possibility is nice and probably legit for, for some use cases, but I was mind blown of the idea to do so. So um, don't do everything you, you just can do. Um, the point is, um, the article, uh, article started uh, quite a bit of discussion. Um, most of them disadvised um, that she should, uh, should uh, use um, containers um, for desktop applications with access to the X server um, and it might open a risk for keyloggers or something. Another nice thing is, there it is, uh, it's a bad idea to do something like this. Wait, I get it a bit bigger. Um, yeah, if you have access to the, to the Docker command line, you can do such a fun thing. You start a container, uh, it's a Ubuntu machine, you pass on the slash, which means the root file system of your, of your host system. You mount it or pass it in as, as TMP and um, inside the container and then you just do a, recur a recursive 
remove uh, inside the container and the file systems of your host system are actually gone. Um, think about what you're doing, as with all technology. The problem is that without um, user, um, that at the moment, uh, it's enough to be a member of the Docker group, that the group uh, on your system that defines who is allowed access um, to use the Docker um, command line interface <coughs> to start such a destructive container. So uh, Docker uh, containers are currently started um, under the UID of root, which results in rather, I'd say, extensive permissions. Um, that means that uh, passing in the right pass or device or something can do, let you do fun things, um, but also um, pretty destructive fun, and um, you otherwise wouldn't be allowed to. So if you go on a bit further and think of this in an NFS environment, um, where the Docker host is to not and has access to interesting uh, shares and the curious user has the right um, to add users inside the container and he can just do fun things and yeah, still his curiosity. Okay. So, yeah. So that's, that's quite interesting because that prevents us from putting Docker in production. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely would be going as development because such situation with users won't be possible. Not allow that in a big system. Yep. Could be very but NFS version 4 could help to a certain extent. Uh, no, that, uh, even though even talking about local, mm -hmm. I mean local for any device, I mean when mm -hmm. the user is allowed to have access, that's a problem and that cannot be in production. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan for, uh, I know there are some <coughs> alarms going on like my Docker and other stuff will be coming out. I'm going to talk about this okay. exactly now. Okay. So uh, I didn't want to freak you out by any means. Um, <laughs> I think the most uh, issues can be dealt with by some sort of organizational means. Um, this might mean when things get a bit more secure, it, they get a, lit, yeah, a little bit less easy and a little bit less fun, but yeah, that's a general problem with security. I just want to share some ideas of, on how to deal with these issues. Um, He's going to talk a bit more about um, some of the stuff later and is working on is something I'd be really, really wishing for is a fine-grained access to the Docker command line. So as I already mentioned, it's enough to be a member of the Docker group um, to have some fun. Um, yeah, if no other security measures are in place, and we'd all wish for a more fine-grained access model to the Docker client. For example, limiting access um, when passing directories into the container or something. Um, this is something he's talking about a bit later. Yeah? But I mean, uh, there's, there's batteries are included, but removal, right? So you can pass all the Docker commands through a proxy kind of program which filters out and defines, okay, this user is not you allowed to do run minus not B. Not the way so it's done by default. Yeah, sure, but I mean, there are, there are ways to secure it, but yeah. it's, it's... That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> just saying. Um, furthermore, we expect some improvements um, for SE Linux, uh, from SE Linux. The point is we just wish to have something like this out of the box and being more def uh, secure by default. Um, you can do a lot of great things and solving lots of problems, but yeah, they just take effort and um, just make things harder. Um, so um, from a complete paperwork uh, level of things at our company, joining the Docker group uh, means that you have to fill out the exact form for, for um, use to getting root access um, to your own machine. So also on the wish list is the possibility to start containers with lower per uh, permissions as implemented uh, with LXC, I think. Um, one of the possible solutions besides the proxies he's going to talk uh, about later is yeah, to use some form of more or less ugly wrapper scripts. Um, um, for example, by limiting actions it might result in bad things to, um, by something like Zulu scripts with hard-coded calls to the Docker command line or yeah, stripping stuff away. Um, on a more self-service oriented level, um, some sort of self-service portals with limited access uh, with limited access to well-defined containers or pass option can help, I think. Um, this is in general considered to be wise in a multi-tenant environment with a higher level of untrusted users and increased chance of yeah, attacks or something. Okay, so use something around um, the straight access to the Docker command line. Um, as I already mentioned with a with, um, with, uh, hint to the Ian Jackson talk, is um, use of application containers instead of system containers wherever possible. 
So um, yeah, further risks can, can be reduced um, reduced by the already discussed um, application containers by providing containers for special use cases, for example, compute jobs. In my opinion, there's just no real reason a user should be granted something like a root shell for computation. This is something you wouldn't do with containers, you wouldn't do with VMs, you wouldn't do with bare metal systems. So a containerized compute job is, in my opinion, the perfect example for, for an application container. It just does one thing, and that is, yeah, turn input data into output data, and then cease to exist. So um, the main problem is when containers are considered as sort of one-to-one -one replacement for, for VMs and the user is granted interactive access to. Um, this just increases risks of all things, as with all systems. So rule of thumb, one process, uh, process per container. Um, when you want to move Docker to production, the good thing you can do is um, use your own registry instead of Docker or something. This completely yeah, eliminates the, uh, the question, can I trust this image? Is this image provider um, secure or whatsoever um, yeah, when, you, when you use your own registry? The, the another thing is, um, for at least for HPC, you can find tons of, uh, tons of images there, but for HPC it's rather narrow what you, what you can find there. And um, the same goes for Docker files, um, yeah, as goes for any code snippet from the internet. Read them, understand them, and only use if you understand what they're doing. So as I've got some minutes left, I'll just give you a brief overview to yeah, get you started with Docker. I'm just going to walk you through a few installation steps. Yeah. Maybe, maybe if, if there are questions, maybe we halt here before you turn into the getting no started. No problem. So any questions so far? Okay, I'm just gonna show you, give you a very brief introduction, show you how to start your first container, what you have to keep in mind on Windows and Mac OS. So the idea is you can just go out, install Docker if you haven't done before, and um, start with a simple Docker file or something. So installation is pretty simple. On Linux, it's just a matter of apt-get install Docker, yum install Docker, or use the script provided from the Docker homepage. Windows, it's more or less the same as for macOS. You've got a fancy graphical installer, which uh, is a Docker toolbox. The former, formerly used um, boot to Docker is now deprecated, and the Docker toolbox is the way to go. <coughs> you use the installer. Um, it says what's included. For example, the Docker client binary, kindmatic, which is a fancy desktop GUI for Docker. Uh, I never really used. And some other stuff, um, yeah, we just can skip after the installation, you can pick your, your, the tool you want to use. I think if you want to try some tutorials, uh, tutorials I'd, I'd prefer if you, if you use the command line interface because, yeah, clicking in a GUI is not that nice. So, um, when, you, when you click on, uh, when you start the GUI, uh, the, crutch, um, the command line, after an eternity of 30 to 60 seconds, which are required to start the VM, as um, Docker does not run natively on, on Mac or Windows or something, you should be presented with this, Moby Doc, and the Ray command line prompt. So, um, yeah, remember, just remember <coughs> that Docker does not run natively, <coughs> and you, yeah, need this um, special Linux VM, um, and it's included in the installer. So, um, I quickly checked what OS I'm in, and then first an initial Docker run. I want an Ubuntu and I want to have access to the bash. And when pulling an image for the first time this from the registry, this might take some time. And hooray, I got down there and yeah, a, con a terminal inside a Linux container. And remember, you have to pass a command, something like sleep, uh, sleep 30 instead of the bash will also work, but yeah, it results in a container living for roughly 30 seconds. So as I mostly use CentOS, I did the same with the CentOS operating system. There you go, I have a Red Hat release or a CentOS release. Um, that's the way uh, Kitematic looks, the graphical interface. It has a bit of an App Store look and feel, including likes, which is quite fancy, haha. -ha. Um, but it works too, and I guess um, for most tutorials you, you should uh, consider using the command line interface. Um, to show you that there's actually a VM running, um, I just grabbed um, for, for the VirtualBox processor from the Joes here that there's a headless um, virtual machine running on my system. Um, for the benchmark, I talked about startup time. So what I did was um, just use, um, yeah, stop the time for, for, for Docker round of a Hello World container, which was Echo's 
hello world out and you see it's yeah it is started um, did his job and terminates after like half a second so using this is really fast imagine a virtual machine even with stripped down services and, and something and doing this would be roughly I guess in 30 seconds area so um, that we've talked about docker files um, and conclude this very little demonstration of how to get started with the basics um, we're going to create a very small docker file and it just consists of this um, yeah it starts from an existing image it's the ubuntu image i did not include any specific version or something this is just really meant to be pretty basic um, and you can also see that images can depend on one another then i'm gonna run the command up get install minus y engines which is needed for the web server um, to be installed and afterwards um, we're going to run a command that starts the web server <coughs> in the foreground and we are going to expose port 80 um, HTTP so that we can access the web server from out of the container so um, afterwards we have to build the image and wait for a moment until it's ready to use this is the build command uh, docker build um, my fancy label here and um, the folder where it finds the docker file so there you go um, this is what happens when the image gets built uh, in case you're wondering what the using cache uh, means here docker will cache the results of the first build of a docker file so allowing um, subsequent builds to be faster than yeah starting from scratch and yeah it was pretty fast in the end um, because i had to fiddle a bit um, with the engines um, command to keep it running in the foreground and uh, it's really nice so now what um, we want to access this and um, we can um, and we use docker ps to find out um, the ID of the container this is required um, for terminating it afterwards and docker ps also shows um, what port on the host it is running it's 32773 and it's mapped to port 80 inside the container and um, this is all we need to access it hmm okay what you should remember is at least in mac os you're not able to use local hosts there's no mapping from a, a port on your system inside the vm into the container um, you have to keep this in mind it might get you confused if you yeah at least if you're um, used to to working on a linux system and switching there so what you have to do um, the output from from the command line interface shows that the uh, docker is con the docker um, host system is running on this ip address and um, when you do this ta -da, there's your web server running and you can also if you don't want this random port you can you can specify <coughs> the port he, he has to use using the minus p flag um, which specifies the host port and yeah for the conclusion so first of all docker has a lot of things to offer especially for computing and scientific workflows in my opinion it's easy First of all, is the deployment of application and its dependencies, configuration uh, isolation that goes along with it, and this with almost no performance cost. Um, yeah, performing close to bare metal. All the possibility to use the same image on yeah, all the machine you want, your laptop, your workstation, cluster, cloud, whatever, and easily shared with, with other third parties. Um, for HPC, the possibility of Docker can lead to increased dynamic utilization of resources, even for legacy applications. Um, most of the aspects are also doable with VMs, but well, Docker has a complete set of tools around it, and yeah, it's just much more fun to use. And um, well, speaking of tools, we haven't spoken a single word on orchestration tools, but this is not the topic um, of this talk. On the downside, it can lead to a higher organizational cost if done in a more or less secure way, at least at the moment. And um, for the German speakers, this image might be funny. Um, I'll explain to the rest of the coffee. Um, what I want to talk about is even though um, Docker already has very, very lots to offer for computing, we still hope for ISV support. Um, the software developers directly yeah, containerizing their applications. Um, better support in queuing systems later at this talk and um, ways to easily implement um, docker into current HPC workflows this is something we are um, taking a closer look at the moment so overall conclusion um, docker is not fancy new virtualization 2.0 it's something rather different 
It's pretty good for portable deployment. It's for sharing um, yeah, your application uh, and the reuse of components. Um, it performs better for computing than classical virtualization. Um, security, as with everything, has to be insured, but can be insured. And getting started is quite easy. So go out and yeah, enjoy. And thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, now some questions for Holger. Go ahead. I have one question. Yeah. If you have a parallel HPC application running, let's say, on four different processes, do you need four different uh, Docker containers? Or all four processes in one container? It and depends. What happens if you want to spread them to four different servers? It depends. The point is, um, running on the same system is no problem. If you have this distributed, this is something we're yeah, taking a closer look at at the moment. Yeah, I mean, Jerome always says that uh, if you can put it in the way that uh, if it runs in a container, if you put it in a way that it runs as a process or not, then you can run it in a, in a Docker container. Because what, what uh, Olga explained is that a Docker container is just a bunch of pro or a process group that is isolated from other process groups. So if you can access other containers via SSH or what have you on different hosts, then you can even run an API job on, on yeah. in different uh, containers or different bare metal installations. But if you run on one single container and this process spawns other processes, then it's within the same context of the container, so you can run it. So if you if that answers your questions, right? If you want to spawn multiple processes within the container, then you can because it's if you spawn a process within a container, then it sticks inside of the same container. So it's, it's the same. And if you've got some sort of communication between the containers, you can also do distributed, but you can't, well, I don't know, fork from one machine to the other or something. Yeah, you can't, but you need a system that will take care of that. Hmm? You, need, you, need a, yeah, yeah, yeah. you need a framework that will take care of that. If you have a framework that has integrated containers, then the framework can actually spread the containers. As long as the, the framework can talk with your underlying system, either it's an HPC or a cloud, or it doesn't matter. As long as your framework knows how to talk with the, with the computer and knows how to like deal with dockers, like switch them off, switch them off, send them, it, w it can do it, but you need a framework. So this framework is below uh, MPI? Uh, no, this framework should be above MPI. Above MPI? Yeah. But, uh, is it something like managing the containers and I calling will, them? Yeah, yeah I will show. Them. I will show because we have done something like that. I will show exactly. It's, so it's a high level parallelization because you want to parallelize the data, right? Well, I have a parallel HPC application <laughs> with I, I based on MPI. Yeah. Yeah, also, so. How can I yeah, we can containerize it? Maybe we can, we can yeah, if Maria will I cover it, then we will cover okay. it that way. Or you so can, we can talk over coffee. I, I have also done some MPI. So before we move, um, what about stability of Docker? So we, the first phase of testing it, we have seen a lot of current crashing. Okay. And then we move really? to current 3, 3.1. Three and that's where we have now gained a little bit more stability. I'm wondering at this level, I mean, do you have any minimum requirements to have um, a better stability environment? So I, mean, I was using 6.6 .6 Red Hat or something or whatever, and when we had continued crashing of the docker. 7.0 is working quite well. Okay. I don't have any problem at all. It's, it's because of the kernel. In fact, when you yeah, exactly. Docker, it's telling you that you need uh, a kernel version greater than I don't remember now. Yeah, but six six is two thirty two or two six thirty two some back ports included. Yeah, so, but they had to yeah. they had to use yeah. Okay, so it's a kernel only kernel. That's yeah, okay. that's all. That's fine. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So Docker uses the sys uh, the sys call, so it's it's not Docker is not involved in, in, in this kind of stuff. So. Some more questions? Oh, <coughs> hopefully we will have time at the end, but maybe we don't. So, so over yeah. coffee, I'm gonna stay yeah. around here for. If it's days. specific over coffee, if it's generic, then maybe uh, we will find some time. Okay, so thanks, Holger. That was very, very nice, very, very neat. Um,